All right, so let's, we're going to move on uh, this morning, and now we're going to talk about, again, those advanced cardiac therapies, um, the ones that most of us throw up our hands and say it's time to refer the patient to someone. So let's do a few questions here of uh, patients with stage D heart failure. So the first one is a 74-year-old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy and EF of 20% presenting to the clinic for follow-up. He had bypass surgery five years ago and recently had an angiogram with severe native vessel disease but patent grafts mild COPD, type 2 diabetes, and he's had two admissions in the past six months for acute decompensated heart failure, currently short of breath walking to the mailbox. Recently had right heart cath with a cardiac index of 1.9, his wedge pressure was 26, his right atrial pressure is 9, and has a single chamber ICD. His ECG shows a QRS duration of 100 milliseconds. He's euvolemic on exam. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Upgrade his ICD to a CRTD, do PCI of the native coronary arteries, evaluate for cardiac transplant, evaluate for a VAD, or start continuous IV milrinone. All right, let's see what we've got here. So biggest votes for Millernone and VAD evaluation. Question two is you're called to the emergency department to admit a 50-year-old man status post-cardiac transplant six months ago. Earlier this week, he had a suspected viral illness with nausea and vomiting. Symptoms have subsided, but for the past two days, he's had dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea. His heart rate's 117, blood pressure 110, SATs are 92. The ECG shows right bundle branch block. There's RALS on the lung exam. An echo shows the EF is 45% down from 60% prior. What's the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Heparin uh, and coronary angiography, RV biopsy and steroids. Give one dose of IV Lasix and arrange for outpatient RV biopsy. Do an RV biopsy, start rituximab and plasmapheresis or get blood and sputum cultures and start IV vank and cefepime. A lot of people getting the biopsy and steroids. Question number three, which of the following patients with advanced heart failure does not have a contraindication to transplant listing at this time? A six-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes and a hemoglobin A1C of 9. A 37-year-old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy and a BMI of 40. A 50-year-old man who recently cut back from one pack per day to a half pack per day of cigarettes. A 40-year-old man who developed severe cardiac allograft vasculopathy after his first heart transplant 10 years ago. Or a 58-year-old woman with right heart cath revealing a mean PA of 50 a wedge of 26, and a cardiac output of three liters per minute with minimal change with nitroprusside. So one of those five patients does not have a contraindication. The rest of them do. Which one has no contraindications? Okay, two-thirds say the vascular path. Question number four, a 72-year-old man with a HeartMate 2 VAD placed five years ago had difficulty controlling his INR on warfarin, but has otherwise done well. He describes three days of shortness of breath and today noticed T-colored urine. Labs demonstrate an INR of 1.8, LDH is 1,800, creatinine is 1.8 up from a baseline of 1.1. Interrogation of his device demonstrates several power surges. What is the most appropriate next step in management? One, start heparin and consider pump exchange. Two, IV fluids. Three, hemodialysis. Four, thrombolytics and monitor serial LDH. Or five, consult hematology. All right, well, Shannon, thank you for being back. Shannon Dunlay is uh, going to talk to us about cardiac device and replacement therapy. Uh, as you would expect, she works in the Advanced Heart Failure uh, Clinic and the VAD services uh, and has done a great job of putting this all together for us.
who don't deal with these patients every day to try to understand what we need to know. So Shannon, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about cardiac device and replacement therapy. So here are the learning objectives. We're really going to be focusing primarily on talking about heart transplant and left ventricular assist device or LVAD. So first, we're going to talk about how to identify patients with advanced heart failure. And this is a slide that you've probably already seen. It shows the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, stages of heart failure. The one that we're going to be focusing on with this talk today is stage D, or advanced heart failure. Um, the earlier stages, stage A, are people who have risk factors for heart failure, like hypertension or diabetes, but they don't have heart failure yet, and their heart is structurally normal. Stage B are people that have structural heart disease, such as a low EF or diastolic dysfunction, but have never had symptoms of heart failure. And stage C are the people who we think of as the most common group of people who have heart failure. These are people that have the, that structural heart disease, but also have current or prior symptoms of heart failure. Stage D, otherwise known as advanced heart failure, is a group of patients who have persistent severe heart failure symptoms despite attempts to optimize with guideline-directed medical therapy. And these are the type of patients that get referred to us in heart transplant and LVAD clinic for consideration of advanced therapies. There are several criteria for advanced heart failure. Really, when you're seeing patients and evaluating them, there are four main things to look for. The first is the patients with advanced heart failure have severe and persistent symptoms of heart failure. They also have hospitalizations or ED visits for heart failure or malignant arrhythmias, such as ventricular arrhythmias. When you're doing diagnostic testing, the things that you're looking for are objective evidence of severe cardiac dysfunction. Now, the thing we think of most often when we say this is severely reduced ejection fraction, but it could also be patients with severe diastolic dysfunction, with severe valve disease that's not amenable to surgical procedures, or um, severe right ventricular dysfunction. So it's not always just patients with severely reduced ejection fraction. They also need to have evidence of severe impairment of exercise capacity. We're gonna talk more about exercise testing, but generally we're considering cardiopulmonary exercise testing or six minute walk testing for verification in individuals. But even if they can't do that formal exercise testing, if they're telling you, I'm short of breath at rest, or I can't walk to the mailbox without getting short of breath, then just that report from them can also be evidence of advanced heart failure. And finally, they need to have these four things despite attempts to optimize. So when patients are first diagnosed with heart failure, you know, they may have all these things, but they just need guideline-directed medical therapy. And then they feel better, they get better. But patients with advanced heart failure, you're trying to optimize them and they're still having these severe persistent symptoms. There are several clinical events that are useful for identifying heart failure. The most important one is you're seeing a patient in clinic and they're telling me, doc, you know, I just feel worse. I, might, I can't do as much as I used to. So take that seriously and think about looking for other um, signs or symptoms of advanced heart failure. Again, poor exercise tolerance. We're going to talk more about cardiopulmonary exercise testing. If you do a six-minute walk test, the number that we usually think about being associated with advanced heart failure is, a, is less than 300 meters. And again, if they're telling you I'm short of breath with less than a block of walking, that can also be a sign. Recurrent heart failure hospitalizations are a hallmark of advanced heart failure. If you're having to increase their diuretics often or having to back off on their guideline-directed medical therapy because of hypotension or worsening renal function, those are also patients to ask yourself, is this advanced heart failure? If you're seeing decline in end organ function, refractory ventricular arrhythmias or ICD shocks, and anytime you have a patient presenting with cardiogenic shock, you should ask yourself, is this something reversible or does this patient have advanced heart failure? There are several good long-term options for treatment of patients with advanced heart failure. There are two life-prolonging strategies. Um, these include heart transplant and mechanical circulatory support with left ventricular assist device. We've kind of started to get away from the des designation of bridge to transplant versus destination therapy, but I think it's important to know what that means. So bridge to transplant means keeping the LVAD in place until the time of heart transplant, whereas destination therapy means that they're gonna keep it for the rest of their life. These are important because they're the two options that will help people to live longer. So if it's a choice between this, these, for example, and palliative inotropes, you're going to pick the offer the one, and the patients are ambivalent, you're gonna offer the, recommend the one that's gonna help them to live longer. Of course, 
goals of care and talking with patients about their individualized preferences is also important. But in general, if it's between these two options, you would generally offer one of these two rather than inotropes. There are some other strategies. One of them, as I mentioned, is palliative inotropes. These are patients who you'd put on long-term infusions of either dobutamine or milrinone generally. And this, these have been shown to improve symptoms but do not prolong survival. Hospice is a good option for people who have very limited life expectancy, usually less than about six months. It can also, hospice can also be utilized in patients who are nearing the end of their life, even if they've had LVAD or heart transplant. And palliative care is appropriate regardless of the treatment strategy. It's really a type of care that's focused on symptom relief and improving quality of life, and that can be appropriate for no matter what the plan of care is. So to identify patients with advanced heart failure, you're thinking about those that have hospitalizations or ED visits for heart failure or ventricular arrhythmias, severe persistent symptoms of heart failure, severe cardiac dysfunction, and exercise limitation. And those are the type of patients you should ask yourself, could this be a patient who would qualify for some of these advanced therapies? And if so, you refer them to see one of us. So how do we evaluate patients for heart transplant? We're gonna talk first about heart transplant before moving on to mechanical circulatory support. Well, to get things started, heart transplant's been around for quite a long time. Nowadays, most patients um, get a heart transplant using the bicaval technique, which means that the anastomosis is at the level of the inferior and superior vena cava. But a lot of patients, especially historically, have had heart transplant using the biatrial technique. And so if you're seeing an echo on a patient who's had a heart transplant and their atria look really big, they might have had a biatrial um, transplant. And this is where part of their original atrial cuff is retained and so the atria can look really big. The heart is denervated and this results in a higher resting heart rate than most of us have. So it is normal for a patient after heart transplant to have a resting heart rate around 100 beats per minute. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing is one of the important things that we do when we're evaluating patients for heart transplant. And this is because there's some data to suggest that if you have a peak VO2 of less than 14, you could benefit from heart transplant. Now, if you're on a beta blocker, which does suppress the peak VO2 just a tad bit, then the number we use is 12 instead of 14. But it's also important to consider that if you're young, let's say we have a 30-year-old male, well, his peak VO2 is probably supposed to be around 50 or 60. So if he has a peak VO2 of 20, that could be um, somebody who may benefit from heart transplant. So for young patients in particular, you can use less than 50% predicted. This is a list of contraindications and considerations for heart transplant. I'm just gonna go through these briefly. Um, so generally we consider heart transplant and the guidelines suggest to consider it when patients are 70 years of age or younger. Do we never do heart transplants in patients over, over, older than 70? No, but the truth is that as patients get older, they tend to accumulate more comorbidities that may make them not good candidates for heart transplant. So if you're seeing a patient who's over 70, heart transplant might not be the best option for them. High pulmonary vascular resistance, I'm going to talk about a little bit on one of the next slides, but this is something that's particularly important to evaluate for heart transplant. You wouldn't want to give a heart transplant and immunosuppression to somebody who has active malignancy or an infection. Those are things that should be dealt with before listing. Excess comorbidity is also important. As I think Dr. Borlaug mentioned, the best candidates for heart transplant are people who don't have any problems except their heart. Now, of course, we do transplant many patients and most patients who have other medical conditions, but in particular, if they are severely obese, be a migrator than 35, poorly controlled diabetes, those are common relative contraindications to um, heart transplant. It's important to transplant patients with an organ that have a compatible blood group. And we're gonna talk a little bit on a, neck, on a subsequent slide about allosensitization, which is one of kind of the unique things that we think about when we're considering patients for heart transplant. We wanna make sure that it's technically feasible to do the transplant. And so um, prior surgery and anatomy become important, particularly for those individuals who have complex congenital heart disease and have had palliative procedures in the past. Active substance abuse would be a contraindication to um, proceeding with heart transplant. This generally includes tobacco, which is considered a relative contraindication to heart transplant. And we wanna make sure afterwards that patients have enough support around them and our ability, the ability to um, obtain and comply with use of their immunosuppression medications, which are extremely critical to ensuring that they have a good outcome. Now, it's important to note that we consider all these things when we're evaluating a patient for heart transplant prior to listing, but many of them are modifiable. So it may be that patient has one or more of these contraindications. Let's say that they have a BMI that's more than 35. Well, if they're able to lose weight, then they may be able to be listed at a later date. 
Same thing if they're smoking, quit smoking and we might be able to get you transplanted. So a lot of these things are not hard and fast, set in stone forever, but things that we can work with patients on to help them to be um, candidates for transplant. So pulmonary vascular resistance, this is something we always evaluate for patients where we're considering them for heart transplant. And this is really the, um, the resistance conveyed by the pulmonary circulation. And so if you haven't memorized this, this um, equation here, it's an important one to keep in mind. Pulmonary vascular resistance is calculated as the mean PAA pressure minus the mean pulmonary capillary wedge pressure divided by the cardiac output. If it's higher, that means you have more intrinsic pulmonary vascular disease. The normals are on one or two wood units. And if it's high, certainly if it gets above five, that would be a contraindication to transplant. Well, why is that? Well, if we put a, a heart um, from, a, from a donor that has had normal pulmonary pressures into a recipient who has really high pulmonary pressures, what's gonna happen? That's gonna put so much pressure on the right ventricle that it could fail right away. So it's important to screen for this and to not transplant a patient in, until you get it taken care of. So if the PVR is high on the right heart cath, you can do a vasodilator challenge. So we'll generally give nitroprusside and see what happens. If the PVR normalizes with nitroprusside, well, that suggests if you're able to offload the LV effectively, then the PVR might normalize. This can be done sometimes with medications, after load reducing medications, sometimes with inotropes like milrinone that have pulmonary vasodilatory properties. But the, probably the most effective way to offload the left ventricle is doing an LVAD. So sometimes when patients have high pulmonary vascular resistance, we will put in an LVAD. And then oftentimes after months of chronic LV unloading, which LVADs are really good at, the PVR will go to normal and we're able to get them transplanted. Allosensitization is something else we think about a lot for heart transplant and it's good to know about. This means that the candidate has antibodies against HLA antigens, which are on the, on the surface of blood cells and tissue cells. And we can test for this using a panel reactive antibody. We basically know which HLA antigens exist in the population, what their frequency is. And so there are a number of different beads that contain each of these HLA antigens and we mix it with the recipient's serum. And then we test and see how many antibodies are there. If we know that a recipient, a candidate, a candidate for heart transplant, has a lot of antibodies to a specific HLA antigen, well then we say we don't want to give that patient a heart from a donor that expresses that HLA antigen or they're going to get into trouble. Well, what could happen? Well, what could happen is that if you have a lot of antibodies sitting around and you put a heart in that has that HLA antigen, it can basically attack the heart and can cause catastrophic um, consequences. So we always screen for this and we, we um, eliminate potential donors who have, um, when, when recipients have large amounts of preformed HLA antibody to an antigen that they express. So how do you get HLA an antibodies? Well, in general, you get exposed to tissue or blood that's not yours. And of course, this can occur through things like transfusion, surgery, and pregnancy. It's also important to evaluate the donor hearts. Make sure you're giving every recipient a good heart. There, there are a number of things that we think about for this. We want it to be a good fit for the recipient. So we take into account patient size, making sure that that's a good fit. Um, obviously, younger, healthier hearts are going to make for good donors. And so we consider age. We screen for coronary artery disease in our donors. Um, and we also look at things like left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so that's an important part of the um, process when considering a donor for a donor heart for transplant. These data are from the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant, and it shows the um, breakdown of diagnosis for those who received heart transplants from 2010 to 2018. And as one might expect, the vast majority of people receive heart transplants for either ischemic cardiomyopathy or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The most common other things that patients receive transplants for are congenital heart disease. We do retransplant patients who have developed graft dysfunction from any of one of a number of things. If they're otherwise good transplant candidates, then certainly they may be eligible for getting a retransplant. We also do transplants for hypertrophic, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and valvular cardiomyopathies. This slide is also from the ISHLT, and it shows the number of adult and pediatric heart transplants done per year over the last few decades. And so, as you can see, in North America, we do anywhere from around 2,500 to 3,000 heart transplants per year. Although this has increased a little bit over time, it's relatively been fixed over the last few decades. And if you put the context that there are more than 6 million people just in the United States right now with heart failure, you can see that limited organ supply is a problem. We can't find um, organs for everyone who necessarily needs a heart transplant. 
And so when we're thinking about heart transplant, limited organ supply is one of the things that does limit us from helping everyone and providing an organ for everyone that we possibly could. We do the thorough multidisciplinary evaluation to try to select people who are gonna drive the best, the most benefit from heart transplant. And there are a number of unique considerations such as the pulmonary vascular resistance and HLA sens sensitization. Many of the contraindications to heart transplant are modifiable. So we try to work with individuals um, and get things improved if we can. Let's talk a little bit about immunosuppression. There are four main classes of immunosuppression that we use long-term in patients after heart transplant. First, calcineurin inhibitors. These include the older medication cyclosporin, which is less commonly used nowadays, and tacrolimus, which is the one we more often use. Side effects are always important to recognize in something that's easily testable. The most common side effects from tacrolimus are renal toxicity, um, and tremor. A lot of patients will get tremor when they're on from their calcineurin inhibitors, especially when their levels are high. Antimetabolites include azathioprine, which again is kind of an older medicine, not as often used nowadays. And most patients are on mycophenolate mofetil, um, trade name Celsept is most commonly used. The thing that we find most often with the antimetabolites is marrow suppression and leukopenia can sometimes be a limiting factor. Sometimes if patients are developing really low white counts, we have to hold or stop their um, anti-metabolite for a bit. mTOR inhibitors include serolimus and averolimus. These are used variably across the United States. We use them quite a bit in our transplant program. You can't use them right away after transplant because they inhibit wound healing. So patients will generally be on calcineurin inhibitors early after transplant. And then if you want to switch them over to serolimus because it doesn't have the same problems with renal function, and it also can help to be protective against something we're gonna talk about in a little bit, which is that cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Then you wait for them to heal up and you sometimes can switch them from tacrolimus over to serolimus. Steroids are, um, have, the one that we use most often is prednisone and they have all the side effects, of course, that you would think of with steroids, such as wound healing and Cushing's type of things. Now those were kind of the medicines we use chronically for transplant. Right away after transplant, a lot of programs, including our own, will use induction. And this is where you give a high dose of a, an agent to really kind of blast the immune system while you're starting those other oral medications and letting them accumulate. So the one that we use is ATG, antithymocyte globulin, but other programs sometimes use other things. And this really helps to suppress the immune system quickly so that you can get on board the tacrolimus, the steroids, the cell sept. Um, so it just kind of gives you a little bit of time um, early postoperatively after transplant. Nobody's gonna leave the hospital on ATG. It's just something you use early post-op. Most patients, the vast majority of patients, leave the hospital on these three medications, tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisone. That's the triple therapy. Those are, that's what the vast majority of people will go out of the hospital on. And then, as I mentioned, we try to individualize it later. If possible, if we're able to wean steroids without people encountering a rejection, we try to get people off steroids because of all the long-term effects of steroids. And then sometimes, as I mentioned, we'll change from the calcineurin inhibitors such as tacrolimus over to serolimus. This um, tends to have less effects on renal function and also can help to prevent cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Interactions are also something that can, is sometimes easily testable, important to recognize. Um, the immunosuppressive medications do have a lot of interactions. Most of, the, of them are with the cytochrome P450 system. Calcineurin inhibitors are certainly the worst offenders. This is not a comprehensive list, but is the medications we encounter most often that interact with the calcineurin inhibitors. One of them to keep in mind is statins. So these, if you're on a statin, which everyone is after heart transplant, plus a calcineurin inhibitor, then you're at increased risk for statin myopathies. Pravastatin and fluvastatin have the least interaction. We'll use the other statins often, but just um, at the lowest dose that's going to achieve the effect desired and what kind of close monitoring. Phenytoin is one of those that actually lowers tacrolimus levels, so it's kind of unusual in that way. Um, sometimes we'll use phenytoin to lower tacrolimus level when it's at a toxic level, for example, but it's something good to know about. And then one of the things that's kind of one of those things that they often ask about is azathioprine and allopurinol. You don't want to use those two together. They interact in a way where the problem of marrow suppression, which is already an issue for azathioprine, is made much worse. When, so you generally don't use allopurinol in patients who are on azathioprine. Let's talk a little bit about outcomes after heart transplant. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve from ISHLT that shows survival after heart transplant from 1992 to 2017. And overall survival is pretty good. 
So the median survival is around 11 or 12 years after heart transplant, slightly longer in women than men, has been getting somewhat better over time, so that's good. This is kind of a busy slide. It shows the cause of death after heart transplant as you get further out from transplant. I wanna focus in on a couple of things. First, early after transplant, the most common causes of death are graft failure, infection, and multiple organ failure. However, as you get further out from transplant, the most common cause of death is malignancy. Cancer is a huge problem after heart transplant. Immunosuppression increases the risk of almost all cancers, so it's important to be very vigilant with screening for malignancy in patients um, after heart transplant. Rejection is something we worry about after heart transplant, and we surveil for it using endomyocardial biopsy. That's the gold standard to diagnose rejection. We do this often and routinely the first year after heart transplant, and then we try to individualize it a bit after that. So if patients have had no problems with rejection, we can go longer between biopsies. If patients have had um, more problems with rejection, then of course they might need more frequent biopsies. Most patients by more than five years out aren't needing regular biopsies. If you're concerned about the possibility of rejection, don't ever substitute an echo for a biopsy. Certainly it's okay to get an echo, and we do that, of course, to look for um, drop in ejection fraction, wall thickening, other signs of rejection, but you always wanna do that biopsy. It's really the gold standard for diagnosis. There are two main types of rejection. Cell-mediated rejection is con conferred by T cells. Patients are at highest risk for this early after transplant. How long are they at risk? Well, they're always at risk, but the risk of cell media rejection does go down over time. So we see it most frequently in the first six months to year after transplant. This is why we do the biopsies most often in that first six months to one year. Antibiotic, antibody media rejection is conveyed by antibodies. B cells make antibodies, so it's more of a B cell issue. And this is when you have antibodies against the um, HLA antigens that are expressed on the donor heart. Now, I mentioned that you wouldn't want to transplant somebody with an organ where they have a lot of antibodies, but a lot of patients have small amounts of antibodies to HLA antigens. And so certainly over time, sometimes um, those will become a problem um, and cause rejection. Hyperacute rejection, luckily, we rarely or never see. And this is rejection that occurs within minutes to hours of graft reperfusion at the time of transplant. This is, often happens because there's a large amount of that preformed donor-specific antibody, those HLA antibodies that, you've, uh, that you haven't kind of screened for or haven't excluded that donor for. Um, or it can occur, of course, if you transplant an ABO incompatible organ. And certainly this should never happen as we test all um, recipients and donors multiple times to make sure that we're, we know their blood types. Cell mediated rejection, again, you would diagnose this using an endomyocardial biopsy. If you're worried about um, rejection, um, the ways that patients would often present would be heart failure symptoms. That would probably be the most common presentation. Um, we always worry about it when people have missed their immunosuppression medications for one reason or another. Or there's, then sometimes you're just doing echoes routinely and you notice that there's been a drop in ejection fraction or some other signs of possible rejection, like thickening of the ventricle. And in those patients, you'd want to do an endomyocardial biopsy to see. If they show you on the boards or, you know, in real life, uh, a biopsy slide and you see a lot of blue purple dots in there, they're wanting to you to pick up that that's rejection most likely. If patients are symptomatic um, with rejection, you want to hospitalize them. And the first line therapy would be IV steroids. Generally, we'll give any weight-based methylprednisolone um, for about three days IV. Antibody media rejection is a little harder to diagnose and is definitely harder to treat than cell mediated rejection. On biopsy, they look for specific histologic features of antibody media rejection, including complement breakdown products. You still want to treat them with steroids to stop the immune mediated injury, but you also want to remove the circulating HLA antibodies or stop them from making new ones. This can include things like plasmapheresis or even things like rituximab. Uh, so this can be a more challenging problem, um, certainly to treat than cell-mediated rejection, where patients usually respond really well to just IV steroids with cell-mediated rejection and adjustment of their immunosuppression. But the antibody-mediated rejection can be a little more tricky. So think about adding to the steroids some things like at least plasmapheresis. Patients are at increased risk for infection after heart transplant because they're immunosuppressed. We do prophylax for common 
um, viral and bacterial etiologies after heart transplant. Patients get valgancyclovir to prevent CMV and HSV. And it's important to note that CMV can present as anything, but the most common presentation would be fever, night sweats, diarrhea. If you think a patient might have CMV, um, then check a CMV viral load. We also give Bactrim to prophylax for pneumocystis and toxoplasma infections. Cardiac allograft vasculopathy. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this is something unique that happens after heart transplant. It's a form of chronic rejection. It's because of both immune-mediated factors and atherosclerotic risk factors. You can diagnose this on coronary angiogram, but if you just do a regular angiogram, because cardiac allograft vasculopathy just cause, causes concentric narrowing of the vessels rather than focal lesions like um, regular coronary disease sometimes does, you can kind of miss it if you're not really looking for it on angiogram. What you'll oftentimes see is pruning of the distal vessels, or like the vessels all look smaller than they should. But if you do an IVUS, then you can see that kind of concentric buildup that's present. The risk of this increases over time after heart transplant. There's no specific cutoff date where you say, now they're at risk. It's just a cumulative increase in risk over time. If you only have that concentric narrowing throughout the vessels, then PCI is generally not helpful. And the treatment is really aimed at prevention of this with statins. Everyone gets a statin after heart transplant. And then, as I mentioned, our program and others will sometimes convert patients from a calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus over to serolimus um, because that's been shown to help prevent cardiac allograft vasculopathy. If patients do develop this and it's causing graft dysfunction and other symptoms, they could get a retransplant. So that's patients who we definitely would consider for retransplant. Post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. This is something that's just important to be you know, aware of. It's a type of B-cell lymphoma, and recipients who are EBV negative, Epstein-Barr virus negative, are at higher risk. Oftentimes, patients will present with constitutional symptoms or lymphadenopathy or a mediastinal or abdominal mass. If you think, could this be PTLD, the thing you can do is a CT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and you can check an EBV viral load. We, we always visit with our hematologists when we see this. Um, sometimes patients will require chemotherapy, but in some cases it will respond actually to just decreasing the immunosuppression so that, that the bodies can naturally fight off this EBV um, infection. So in summary, Outcomes after heart transplant are good. The median survival is around 11 to 12 years. If you're thinking rejection, do an RV biopsy and start some steroids. Um, patients are at increased long-term risk for infection because of immunosuppression and malignancy. And heart transplant does have the unique risks of PTLD and cardiac allograft vasculopathy um, that it's good to be aware of. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about mechanical circulatory support or LVAD. We'll start by talking about LVAD basics. So this picture is an older um, pump, the HeartMate 2 pump, but um, gives you a good idea about what an LVAD looks like. An LVAD is a surgically implanted pump. We're talking about durable LVADs today. And it provides continuous blood flow from the LV apex to the aorta. It's then powered through a percutaneous driveline, comes out of the upper abdomen, and patients are connected to a power source. During the day, they'll generally have batteries, oftentimes wear them in like a fishing vest, and then at night they can um, plug themselves into the wall through a power module. They are required to be anticoagulated with warfarin, INR goal two to three, and aspirin to maintain pump patency. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we're somewhat getting away from the designation of bridge to transplant or destination therapy. But again, bridge to transplant means that you're going to have the LVAD in until transplant, and destination therapy means you'll have it in for the rest of your life. The reason why we kind of have gotten more away from this is because oftentimes these groups go back and forth, right? So you have a patient implant as bridge to transplant, but then something happens, they're no longer a transplant candidate, it becomes destination therapy. Certainly the opposite is also true. You can implant somebody as destination therapy, they lose weight, they make whatever modifications we're preventing them from getting transplant, and then they become a transplant candidate and go ahead and get transplant. So Medicare has recently removed this designation, at least for the purposes of reimbursement. These are the common LVADs that are FDA approved. Um, the one that's getting implanted almost exclusively now, or for the most part, is HeartMate 3 LVAD. Um, HeartMate 2 is an older version of the LVAD that there are still a lot of patients who have this. This was an axial flow de device. Heartware um, HVAD, is, they're no longer implanting these. 
Um, the company decided earlier this year, but um, there are still many patients who have heartware HVADs. That's shown in the bottom right picture. The HeartMate 3 HVAD looks pretty similar, or, or HeartMate 3 LVAD looks pretty similar to the hardware HVAD. There are several different settings that we look at in patients who have LVAD. The speed and RPMs is something that is the only thing that we can set on the LVAD. The power is a measured um, value of how much power the device is using. And then the flow is an estimated output in liters per minute. This is um, what you would correlate with being like a cardiac output, so how much flow is going through the pump. And it's calculated based on the pump speed and power. Pulsatility index is something that's unique to the HeartMate devices, but it's a number that gives you an idea of the native ventricular contribution to flow, so how much the, um, the individual's ventricles are contributing to flow through the device. And um, it, higher numbers mean more native ventricular contribution to flow. When we evaluate patients for LVAD, we do a very thorough evaluation. So the best candidates for LVAD are people who, you know, have a bad left ventricle, but their right ventricle works great, and they have no other medical problems. Um, so we cer certainly um, that many patients who we implant LVADs in ha do have other comorbidities, but we want to make sure, we want to first look and see you know, how bad their heart function is. We want to look at both their um, left side of their heart and their right side of the heart, their valves, et cetera, um, their functional capacity. But we also want to take a real close look at their other organs. Because if you have more, cardi more non-cardiovascular comorbidities, that's going to make it tougher for the LVAD to really help you to survive and live longer. It's also very important that the patients have good social support for LVAD. They're going to need help from a caregiver after LVAD. And so we do a thorough um, psychological evaluation and, uh, and rely a lot on our social workers and psychiatrists to help to guide us um, to make sure that patients are going to be able to do well and thrive after LVAD and they have that social support that they need. The LVAD coverage criteria, the ones shown here are from Medicare, and they have recently changed because they removed that BTT and DT designation. But the most important things to kind of keep in mind is that the patients have to have a lot of symptoms of heart failure, and their ejection fraction has to be 25% or less. Generally, they want patients to either be inotrope dependent or to have a low cardiac index, um, plus they've kind of failed to respond to medical therapy. Certainly, if they're dependent on a bloom pump or a temporary um, mechanical circulatory support device, and that is something that signifies they probably need some longer-term um, support. We want to make sure that patients are being implanted at facilities that have experience putting LVADs in. Um, and as mentioned, Medicare recently removed the separate criteria for um, bridge to transplant and destination therapy. When we're thinking about who um, or what are contraindications to LVAD, it's important to think about who wouldn't do well with an LVAD. Who, um, what, you know, who are the people who I've given LVAD to and it's not going to help them to live longer and feel better? And so if the survival after LVAD is going to be poor because of non-cardiac issues, then you wouldn't want to put an LVAD in those individuals, right? You wouldn't want to put them through the procedure and have them essentially um, struggle or pass away from something else. So if they already have irreversible end organ failure, if they're already on dialysis, for example, which is probably the one that comes up most often, those patients are not going to do well with LVAD. If they have an active malignancy where their life expectancy from that malignancy is less than two years, then you would hate to put them through a big LVAD surgery, um, which is a lot to recover from um, when they could have been spending their days doing you know, other things. You wouldn't want to put an LVAD in somebody who's likely to have a complication. If they already have an endocarditis with bacteremia and you put a mechanical heart pump in, it's just going to see the pump and, and cause problems. So you want to make sure infections are cleared up before LVAD. As I mentioned before, the LVAD only, only supplies the um, left ventricle. It doesn't work for the right ventricle. So if patients have severe RV dysfunction, then um, they're not going to do well with LVAD. And they need to be able to tolerate anticoagulation to keep the pump patent. If they aren't going to be able to manage the LVAD, they're not going to do well afterwards. So if they have active substance abuse, now tobacco use is fine for LVAD. I mean, we still don't want people using tobacco for their health, but we wouldn't um, deny LVAD in that situation. But if they're using IV drugs or certainly um, sometimes other drugs, then, then we wouldn't want to implant them with LVAD. We want to make sure they can take care of their pump. And they need to have a caregiver. So I'm only including this slide for your studying. It compares some of the contraindications to LVAD versus transplant. Um, but I'm not going to go through it in detail. So when we're evaluating patients for LVAD, um, we do a very thorough evaluation. Um, we, some of the considerations for LVAD are different than those for transplant. So we can transplant 
patients who, um, who have bad RV function for age, um, you know, age really isn't, there's no upper age limit for LVAD, it's more comorbidities that become the problem, whereas for transplant, we usually think about 70 or younger. Um, and BMI, again, for transplant, we would consider if patients were morbidly obese, that would be a contraindication, but that's not always a contraindication to LVAD. And then tobacco, we would be able to put LVAD in somebody who's using tobacco while encouraging them to quit. And now I would like to talk for a few minutes about complications and outcomes after LVAD. So why do we put LVADs in? Well, on average, patients with LVADs, um, compared with those who have advanced heart failure who were treated medically, will have better survival, better quality of life, better functional capacity, a normal cardiac output generally with an LVAD, and it's also very effective at offloading the left ventricle. So usually the LVEDP and pulmonary capillary pressure will normalize after being on LVAD support. This slide shows the survival of LVAD compared with uh, medical therapy in patients with advanced heart failure. And what you see here, and I think it's a little bit better compared with 2001, but when patients have advanced heart failure and they're treated medically, their survival is very poor. It's less than 50% at one year. LVAD treatment and devices have gotten to the point now where survival is 80% or perhaps even a little bit higher at one year. So it's much better than it is with just medical therapy. Who are the patients who we worry about and do a bit worse after LVAD? As I mentioned, if they have a lot of RV dysfunction, LVAD's not gonna help them as much. If they are, already have a lot of irreversible end organ damage, you know, kidney damage, liver damage, that's not gonna be helped much by an LVAD. And if they're sicker going in, they do have somewhat higher early mortality after LVAD. I wanted to bring up a couple of LVAD complications just to know about. So cardiac tamponade, this is something that would occur very early post-op within the first days to week. Everyone comes out of the OR with a chest tube. If the chest tube output stops, patients are hypotensive, and their RA pressure's up, you should worry about tamponade. If you do an echo, the RV is going to look compressed. Those patients need to go back to the OR with the surgeon for exploration of the mediastinum. RV failure can present um, early or late after LVAD. Uh, it presents somewhat similar early after LVAD to tamponade in that the patients are hypotensive with high RA pressure. But if you do an echo on these patients, the RV is not going to be compressed. It's going to be big and dilated. Um, patients oftentimes will benefit from inotropes if they have RV failure. Sometimes, especially early after LVAD, they could benefit from a temporary RVAD. GI bleeding is one of the most frustrating complications after LVAD. It impacts about a third of individuals, and the most common etiology is small bowel AVMs. We would treat these like GI bleeds for patients who didn't have LVAD and that oftentimes will transfuse, do scoping. But if the patients are having recurrent or refractory GI bleeding, then sometimes you have to modify their anticoagulation. We'll generally start by stopping the aspirin first. And then if they're still having refractory GI bleeding, then sometimes we'll have to adjust their INR requirements or try other mechanisms to stop the GI bleeding. LVAD thrombus is something where patients oftentimes present with tea-colored urine heart failure symptoms, high LDH and power spikes. Um, this is, you know, a very kind of typical presentation for LVAD thrombus. This is most commonly found with the older devices, particularly the HeartMate 2. The HeartMate 3, which is the newest HeartMate, which is being implanted now, fortunately, is at much lower risk for having LVAD thrombus. So hopefully this will become less of a problem over time. But if patients are coming in with this, you want to start heparin and consider LVAD pump exchange if they're not responding. Stroke can occur after LVAD and be devastating. You want to get your nurse, neurologist and neurosurgeon involved if this happens. Certainly, if they have a life-threatening intracranial hemorrhage, you would want to stop and reverse the anticoagulation. And then driveline or LVAD infection can be a problem. Driveline infection, most often, the story is, I had a tug at my driveline, like something happened where it tugged my driveline, and then you get purulent discharge at the LVAD driveline exit site. If it's just localized to there, then oftentimes you can just treat them with antibiotics. But once, but if it tracks back or the patient has bacteremia and it seeds the pump, then sometimes those can't be managed with antibiotics alone and may require a pump exchange. A couple of quick LVAD pearls just to be aware of. Patients may not have pulp pulp pulse or cuff blood pressure. Um, we, you want to anticoagulate, as I mentioned, with warfarin and aspirin. A couple of small studies with NOACs suggest those are not a good substitute. And especially with the HeartMate 2 or HeartWare devices, you want to make sure you're bridging patients with heparin or low molecular weight heparin around non-cardiac procedures. Because the pumps keep running, even when you're in VT or VF, symptoms are quite variable. So sometimes patients will have 
little to no symptoms when they're sitting there in, in your office in ventricular tachycardia because the LVAD just keeps running. And it's important to note that if the patient's approaching the end of life and they want to have their LVAD turned off because it's no longer aligns with their goal of care, that's a good discussion, something to get palliative care colleagues involved with, but that is um, something that, that you can do at the end of life. So in summary, survival um, after LVAD has gotten better, at least 80% at one year, and LVAD does improve survival compared with medical management. It's important to be cognizant and aware of the unique complications after LVAD that can occur, which we've just reviewed. So in summary, patients who have advanced heart failure, which is really that refractory to attempts to optimize, you want to consider advanced therapies like LVAD and transplant. If you think they might be a candidate, send them to an advanced heart failure cardiologist. Um, transplant is a great option, but organ supply is really the problem. Immuno immunosuppression is kind of a necessary evil. It does a great job at preventing rejection, but also contributes to long-term complications of infection and malignancy. And finally, LVAD can be implanted in people awaiting transplant or not, um, and does have some of those unique complications. Thank you very much. Very, very much, Shannon. Um, I was, that was fabulous. So let's, have, let's go over your questions again. I, they were actually, they nailed them pretty well even in the pretest. So let's see how much better they got now. So the first one is this 74 year old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy and an EF of 20% presenting to the clinic for follow up. Bypass surgery five years ago, recently had an angiogram which showed severe native vessel disease but patent grafts. He's got COPD, type 2 diabetes, and required two admissions in the last six months for acute decompensated heart failure. He's currently short of breath walking to the mailbox. He recently had right heart catheterization with a cardiac index of 1.9, a wedge of 26, RA pressure of 9, and has a single chamber ICD. His ECG shows a QR restoration of 100 milliseconds. He's uvolemic on exam. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Upgrade his ICD to a CRTD, PCI of the native vessels, evaluate for transplant, evaluate for VAD, or start on continuous IV milrinone. So 81% have said evaluate for VAD. You have indicated that's the question you were, the answer you were looking for. Yeah, no, um, great job with that response. So I do think that evaluation for LVAD is the best answer here. Um, I think it's important first to recognize that this person likely does have advanced heart failure, you know, has severely reduced ejection fraction, has had a couple of hospitalizations, um, has, a, you know, a low cardiac index. Um, the other options, the reason why the other options maybe aren't quite as great, you know, the patient has a narrow QRS, so upgrading to a CRTD probably is not going to be um, as helpful in this situation. Um, cardiac transplant, I think that that's a consideration. The fact that the patient's 74 years old, kind of keep that age of 70 in mind. And the boards for, in particular, they oftentimes want you to choose the best answer, okay? So there might be other answers that aren't necessarily completely wrong, but the best answer here would probably be evaluation for LVAD. The patient's unlikely to be a cardiac transplant candidate at his age with mild COPD and type two diabetes. And then milrinone, this is where I kind of wanted to make sure you know that if given the choice between transplant or LVAD versus milrinone, transplant and LVAD are the better option because they are life-prolonging therapies. And milrinone hasn't been shown to improve life, uh, improve survival, just symptoms. Certainly, sometimes we'll put patients on milrinone while we're evaluating them. And so maybe that's where that is coming from. But I think overall, the best answer here is evaluation for LVAD. Fantastic. All right. Question number two, you're called to the emergency department to admit a 50-year-old man who had transplant six months ago. Earlier this week, he had a suspected viral illness with nausea and vomiting. The symptoms got better, but for the past two days now, he's been dyspnea on exertion with orthopnea. His heart rate's 117, blood pressure 110, O2 sats are 92. His ECG reveals right bundle branch block. He has Rawls on examination. The echo shows an EF has dropped from 60 to 45. What is the most appropriate next step in the management? Is it heparin drip and angiography? Is it RV biopsy and steroid? Is it IV Lasix and arranged for outpatient biopsy? Is it biopsy rituximab and plasmapheresis? Or is it cultures and antibiotics? Ninety-seven percent. 
All right, great. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. This person is presenting with signs of heart failure. You know, the viral illness could have been, they couldn't keep down their immunosuppression medications. Who knows? Um, but they are EFS dropped. We're thinking rejection, rejection, rejection. And that's exactly what you want to do. You want to get an RV biopsy and give them some IV steroids in the meantime. And what's the usual course of, of recovery for someone like this? I mean, how, how are they going to respond to that bolus of steroid? Honestly, oftentimes with cell media rejection, they respond really quickly, especially if it's not, if they're, you're catching it relatively mm -hmm. early. Um, oftentimes they'll feel better even the next day or within a few days. Fantastic. Okay. Question number three, um, which of the following patients does not have a contraindication to cardiac transplant listing? A 60-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes and an A1C of 9.1, a 37-year-old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy and a BMI of 40, a 50-year-old man who recently cut back from one pack per day to a half pack per day of cigarettes, a 40-year-old man who developed severe cardiac allograft vasculopathy after his first heart transplant 10 years ago, or the 58-year-old woman with right heart cath revealing mean PA pressure of 50, a wedge of 26, and a cardiac output of 3 with minimal change to vasodilator. Eighty-nine percent said the cardiac allograft vasculopathy is not a contraindication. That's right, yep. Yeah. Remember, cardiac allograft vasculopathy is kind of that concentric narrowing of the um, coronary arteries that can occur over time after heart transplant. It can cause graft dysfunction, and so we certainly do consider a retransplant in, in patients who develop that who are otherwise good transplant candidates. Um, the smoking is a relative contraindication to transplant, so generally we require patients to quit smoking. We, at our program, we always do. Um, and then the other most common one was, oh, the, um, and this is one that just requires you to do a calculation, so it's a little <laughs> harder on a question, I get that, but um, this patient has high pulmonary vascular resistance, so remember, you would subtract the wedge from the mean PA, and that would be 24, and then divide by three is eight. So that PVR is high, the number you're thinking about is one to two would be normal. So the high PVR um, is something where you wanna make sure you don't, um, you don't transplant those patients without kind of working on that first. Yeah, because otherwise that RV is gonna fail if you put in a heart. Right, yes, exactly. All right, question number four. A 72-year-old man with a HeartMate 2 LVAD placed five years ago had difficulty controlling his INR on warfarin, but has otherwise done well. He's had three days of shortness of breath and T-colored urine. His labs demonstrate an INR of 1.8. His LDH is 1,800. His creatinine is 1.8, which is up from a baseline of 1.1. His LVAD interrogation shows several power surges. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Is it heparin and pump exchange, IV fluids, hemodialysis, thrombolytic, or a hematology consult? Oh, so but we didn't have that. So we don't. We didn't have the distribution. But you did pretty yeah. well on this one to begin with as well. But the, the right answer here is heparin and consider pump exchange because this is a thrombus. Exactly. Yep. yep. And um, hopefully, as I mentioned, the HeartMate three LVAD, the risk of this is extremely low. So hopefully, we'll be seeing less and less of this over time. Fantastic. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for putting this together. Fabulous job.